Would you please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And we shall read verses 14 to 16. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The Lord Jesus' greatest concern for the church is that we will do the will of him that loved us and chosen us in this world to be his people. And to do his will as a church means that we serve him within the church and out in the world. As he said in verse 13, which we studied last Lord's Day, we are the salt of the earth. We are not taken out of this world yet. We live in this earth and we are here to influence the earth. To make the right impact. And so today, this thought is further taken through the imagery of light. How can we influence the world if we are not different from them? If we are the same, then there is nothing to tell them. There is nothing to show them so that they may Pursue a different way of life. If we think like the world, if we act like the world, we are worldly. We don't belong to the kingdom of Christ. Those who belong to Christ think and act. Very different from others in this world. And the difference is Christ. As I reminded you last Lord's Day, what makes us salt and light is our new nature that God gives to us. And this has already been Ill, uh, very wonderfully demonstrated by Christ in the early part of chapter 5. The Beatitudes, the blessings of Christians, that blessed nature that God has given to us. And I do not want to repeat those things again. So you see, by the grace of God, we are now endued with a character that can influence the world. You have what it takes to influence the world. Not that you have it on your own, but God has graciously bestowed upon us. Now, toward the end of that beatitude, our Lord actually said that blessed are they which are persecuted. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. 
So this world doesn't welcome us. They are hostile to us. The unbelieving world is hostile to us. But that is a blessedness, Jesus says. Blessed are they which are persecuted. Amazing. How can I influence someone when they don't want to listen to me? How can I influence someone when they are trying to keep me at a distance? Could I talk to a person if he doesn't want to hear me? Could I affect his mind to cause him to think differently when he doesn't want to even have a look at me? When the world is trying to confine me into a prison and lock me out or take my life and snap me off, how can, be, how can I be an influence in this world? And that's the problem we have in our mind. But don't worry about that problem. Just listen to what Christ says. You are blessed. And I can tell you, if you have paid attention to uh, verse 10, you have a very clear statement of Christ as to what it takes to be an influential Christian in a hostile world. And it is the word righteousness. Blessed are they which are persecuted for what? Righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Righteousness. That's very powerful. A godly living can tear down walls of separation. It can cut through barriers and fences and prison walls. It can bring down hostility. It puts us near the heart of those who oppose us. Let me just quickly illustrate this with a very familiar story in the Bible. Joseph was in Egypt because his brothers hated him. They sold him. He ended up as a slave in Egypt. In the house of a man called Potiphar who was an officer in King Pharaoh's palace. He was a very lovable person, very trustworthy, a good steward. And so Potiphar appointed him over all things except his wife. Understandable. But his wife was a wicked woman. She set her eye on Joseph. Joseph knew this is danger. Firstly, it is a temptation to sin against God and to sin against his master. So when Potiphar's wife made the move, he fled. But she got hold of her, his coat, tear it, and then shouted against him. So he was arrested, unjustly thrown into the dungeon. He was there. There is no hope of making any impact in the life of the people. He is now distanced from his own family. He is now taken away from a place where he was faithfully carrying out his work. He was happy there. He didn't choose this path. Circumstances change. You see, my dear friends, we all labor to do this and that. But there is no guarantee we can finish them. God changes circumstances. Changes our comfortable places. And sometimes put us in the most frightening circumstances. But Joseph never gave up his faith and his godliness. He remained righteous, prayerful in the dungeon. And that won the respect of the prisoners. 
And the Lord gave him extraordinary ability to interpret dreams. We know that. As a result of interpreting some of his co-prisoners' dream, he ended up finally in uh, Pharaoh's palace. Not in Potiphar's, but in the palace of Potiphar's boss. You see how God now promoted him? Every trouble is leading him higher. The reason? His righteousness. His prayerfulness. And we all must learn this. Physical, material realities are not that make us influential. It is not wealth. It's not popularity. It is not our place among the elite of the world. But it is that closeness with God wherein His purity fills us and molds us. And that breaks down, that breaks down everything that the world will put to stop us. Blessed are the persecuted for the righteousness sake. So the Lord went on to say, remember, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now please, when troubles come. When people bad mouth you. When they slander you. When they throw you into jail. Do not lose your spirit. Do not lose your heart. Rejoice. Because there you are going to influence a world that was without the knowledge of Christ. God was gracious in saving Apostle Paul from his anger and hatred toward Christianity. We know it was a dramatic experience. He was on his way to persecute Christians. At the gate of Damascus, the Lord met him. And there was a big light that was greater than the midday sun that rendered Saul, who became Paul, blind. At that time, the Lord said, I will make you a witness even before the kings. Paul had no idea how is he going to stand before a king. You know, you and I know by now how he stood before not only King Agrippa, but even before Caesar the highest king, the Roman emperor. How did he manage? He couldn't get permission to get there. But God worked it out through persecution. He was arrested and was transported from Jerusalem all the way up to Rome. And there he had to be in prison, in the high security prison of the palace. And there he preached the gospel to the soldiers and they heard the gospel. And later he stood before the Caesar to give witness to Christ. You see, my dear friends, God did not send us to a friendly world. God sent us to a persecuting world and then said, there is darkness. There is all sorts of unsavory experiences. There is defilement. There will be putrefying effects of sin. But mind you, I have called you to be the savior of the world. You are the salt. You will bring flavor to them. There is darkness, but I have called you as light. You will lead them to my light. God never apologizes to us that he allow us to be in this wicked world. He rather says, rejoice. The Lord Jesus says, rejoice. 
that you are being persecuted because when you are squeezed by the world, you will produce the most wonderful aroma, the sweetest aroma. You know, like if you have ever handled flowers. It's always very wonderful to smell it. Last night we were at the wedding dinner of Brother Quan Thing and Sister Mabel. And then there was a stalk of flower on our table. Rose. And then John Pei and Catherine brought the little fellow Christopher. Um, Brother Bun Siang and Sister Hui Lin's son. They like to carry him around. So they were sitting on another table and they carry him over to our table. And Christopher reached out for that flower on the table. He took it. I was watching him. He looked at it. Then he brought it and smelled it. I said, eh, who taught him that? He's such a young boy, just learning to walk. How come he smelled this? And he just, and we, some of us who observed it said, oh, he know how to smell the flower. But I think if you spend more time with the flower, soon you find out there's another way to get the smell better. Take the petal, crush it in your hand. You don't even have to go near the flower. The smell will just come into your nose. More pressure applied. The more you crush it, the sweeter the aroma going to be. Christians, let me tell you, the harder the problems we face, the more painful circumstances we have in this world, the sweeter we become for Christ's sake. And the Lord has not told this to anybody else in this world. But to the Christians. We are told. Ye are the light of the world. What a tremendous truth. It is the people who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And became blessed. Whom God assigned into this world. One of the things that. I worry. Sometimes. Not all the time. But sometimes. Is that in our church. We can be so comfortable with. So many fellowship groups. And so many activities. That we fail to realize. There is a need for us to get out. And be persecuted. So that we can win some back to the church. There is. A clear reason why we promote fellowship within the church. That is to strengthen ourselves. To, to help us to grow in the knowledge of God's word. And to be comforted when we are troubled. But there is also an equally important reason why we have fellowship. That we may tell the brethren, fear not, get out. If you get wounded, we will pray for you. We will support you. If you need comfort, come back. We will strengthen you. But let's go out. The church is not a place where people come and find a comfortable seat, enjoy a wonderful musical orchestra, and then go home and say how nice it was. Then a few hours later you completely forget about Christ and his righteousness, and then go back to the world and then dance according to the rhythm of the world. No. Sometimes this is my fear. That a church that lacks suffering. I'm not talking about sickness. I'm not talking about loss of job. I'm talking about hostility from the world. Seem to be a very weak church. Not that. God is weak in helping them, but they seem to be too comfortable with their 
luxury of fellowship and activities within the church that never steps out. However, you know, I'm not just talking about one hour evangelism you do in HDB flats around this church or go on to Orchard Road or Pile Bar MRT station. These are good and they must be done, but it is more than that. As long as the world is out there, you are supposed to be a light there. Every time when you are away from the church, you ought to be a light. Whether you are riding on the train or whether you are taking a taxi or whether you are walking in the park or whether you are marketing uh, or going for shopping or studying in school or working in your factories and companies, you are supposed to be a light. There is no time Christians are not to be light. You may be on holiday. There you are to be a light. You may be with your clients or customers. You got to be a light for Christ. Or light of Christ in that place. Among your friends. All the time we are to be the light of the world. And that's what Christ said. Ye are the light <coughs> of the world. That's God's plan. God's plan must be our most exciting agenda in life. Not what we want to do. We get excited about finding a new job or going to the new place of work, or um, now trying to do well in our studies, a new course started, or a new school year begins, or exams are coming. We get very excited about all these things. And in the process, we completely forget who we are in this world. I fear that lots of Christians today are so occupied with the worldly engagements, they totally forget who they are in those places. You know, if you are a doctor, I pray that you'll be a good Christian doctor. Don't be embarrassed that some people know that you are a Christian. Let it be known. When you look at a <clears throat> <clears throat> patient who come into your clinic or into your uh, hospital. If you have an opportunity to share the gospel, don't lose it. If the institution that you work for says you cannot preach the gospel to your patients, well, you can't break the rule. However, do not forget to comfort them and say a word for Christ wherever possible. If they say don't evangelize them on the bed, then don't evangelize. But if you get an opportunity like, oh, uncle, you look very, very troubled. I will pray for you. You just say it. For that, if, if they sack you, go home. Praise God. God is going to call you as a missionary doctor. Don't worry. Don't be so afraid. I don't know why Christians are so afraid today, so afraid. In fact, we have so much freedom in this country. We are not living in Iran. Even Christians in Iran would give their life and they stay in the prison for years and years just because they are Christians. But here there, are, there is so much freedom by the grace of God. Yet... Christians seem to be so embarrassed to bear witness because of fear. Young people fear that they will lose their friends. So they won't want to appear as Christians. There are young people who, uh, who do, want to make more friends of the worldly kind 
So they hide the fact that they are Christians. How tragic it is. Ye are the light of the world. Is that true about you? You see, if you are a Christian, there's no other definition for you. You are the light of this world. So the Lord asked, after making this amazing statement in verse 13, I'm sorry, verse 14. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. You see, he is saying that when you build a city on the top of a hill, it can be seen by people around that hill. From far people can see this city. Especially in the night. When all the lights are turned on. In the dark darkness that pervades the valley. When they look up they can see it. When you look. And some of the stories of people who went into the sea for whatever reason, whether fishing or uh, take, making a long journey through the sea to another country, in olden days used to get into great trouble because of storm and all those issues. And the navigation tools were not well developed as it is today. So in the night, they don't know where they are. What direction they are going. It's all darkness. And sometimes. These little lights. That are. Found along the. Shores of the sea. Are a great aid. And I remember reading. The story behind the hymn. Let the lower light. Be burning. There is such a hymn. In our hymnal. And that was written. For a purpose. I was wondering, how come it says, let the lower lights be burning? How come it's not, let the lights on the top of the lighthouse be shining? Why lower light? So I was curious, and one day I came across a story behind this hymn. And you need to have some knowledge of the sea and the, and the problems that the ship face. You know, when a ship is about to uh, come to the shore, especially in the night, it always have the risk of running into rocks. And so, some fishermen would spread the nets on the rocks to dry it and then to mend it. And sometimes they put the candles in the night because they are still on the rock. These are not High rocks, they are lower ones in the ocean level. And one day there was a ship that was coming closer and closer. But the captain of the ship knew it's very dangerous because there are a lot of rocks along that seashore. So he told his assistant on the ship, now watch out for the lower lights. Those little candles that are shining, on the top of the rocks are great help. If you ignore them, you may run into them and the ship will be destroyed. Some of you may not be great preachers. You may not be well known. Your skills may be few. Your power to influence others may seem to be very little. But you are still Christ's light in this world. Some of us are like a city on the top of a hill with great powers of influence by the grace of God. Some others are little lambs in the house. But when you, when you light a little candle or a lamb, you don't keep it under a bushel. You don't cover it. Because if you cover it, its light cannot be seen. So whether you are a city on a hill or a little lamb in a dark room, you are meant to shine. And you will shine.
You know, my dear brothers and sisters, this gives me great excitement. My message may not come with a lot of fervor today. However, I pray that the Spirit of God will transfer what I'm feeling into your heart. Because these words of Christ tells us we can influence this world. There are people who have weird ideas. I got to be like them who are so powerful, so influential, so well placed in life, then only I can be influential. And such a notion is absolutely wrong. You may be a homemaker and you can be a powerful influence in your children's life. And through your children, you will attain things that no one else could have. It is often said that the famous preacher John Wesley and his brother Charles Wesley, who wrote many of the wonderful hymns that we sing, had a very praying mom at home. And her prayer has changed that family. And made her sons great in the kingdom of God. Your duty can be one of prayer at home. Praying so much for the children. Not out in the world trying to make a name. You know, this world is very fond of honoring those who are influential, wealthy. So if you are a mother who leaves the children behind and make a name for your company and become a CEO of multinational company, then you are the best mother in Singapore. And they give you an award. Nobody picks, picks up a praying, dedicated home mother who has brought up many children of great faith and and character and say let me give you a national day award I have not seen one yet every time when they list a group of people uh, for the best mother in Singapore they are the high flying ones I don't want to teach them anything at this moment I rather teach you don't be fooled by this thinking don't be fooled by this thinking You don't have to be a CEO. You can be a taxi driver. You can be a cleaner. And that you can be a great influence for Christ. Maybe you may become a great man in this world. Maybe the Lord would make you uh, a successful businessman. Or a famous musician. Or a famous doctor. May the Lord's will be done. Some of us will be like Daniel or Joseph or men who have had such great success in the world. But some of us may never be in such scenarios. We may be just fishermen. (laughs) But still, if Christ is in you and if you pursue righteousness, you are still a light of the world. And I therefore want to encourage you all. Please believe what the Lord says. Please believe it with all your heart. Don't let anybody look down on you. Or make you think that you are useless. You are unprofitable. No. And I pray that in this church. We believe every word that Jesus utters. And give ourselves totally to live the way he wants us to live. And look, this is now your duty. Having known what the Lord made you to be in this world. Now this is your duty. Verse 16. Let your light so shine before men. That they may see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men. Now what is that light Jesus is talking about? That they may see your good works. Now Jesus Christ is the light. For he said I am the light of the world. And when Jesus shines through us. 
everything he commands us to do is the good work you do. You know, a lot of people think that good work is whatever I feel is good is good. Or what people think is good is good. No. In fact, many things that people think is good is bad in the sight of God. And many things that God says good are found to be useless and unacceptable to this world. And that's the way it is. So when we talk about good works, let's don't divine works that pleases men, but as works that pleases God. Things that the Lord teaches us to do, they are good works. Now, so when you're out in your world, in your place, you ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? Is this a path you want me to go? Is it a profession that I should take? If it is not, I don't want. You know, there is great glory that God receives from people who give up great wealth or great salaries or great earnings to be righteous. They don't take every offer that comes their way. They are bold to say, no, I don't need this. I'm happy with this. You know why? Because they want to do God's will. And also, there are those who want a comfortable life and so they don't take hardships in life. They don't want hard work and labor. And as a result, they miss out on carrying out God's work. Because sometimes God's work means what? Toil and labor. Why many people don't want to be a pastor? Hard life, huh? difficult. Huh? Hey, why don't you pray that one of your children be a missionary to, to a foreign country? Aya, please, Pastor, I have only one, and I'm hoping he will look after me when I'm old. If he's a missionary in Africa, or if he's a missionary in, a, in Alaska, <laughs> then, uh, you know, when I'm dying, he won't be around. I want my son to close my eye. Don't, don't tell me this sort of thing. You see? If you are not daring and brave enough to suffer, you cannot do the work that God wants you to do. If you look for the wealth, if you look for the comfort and pleasure and luxury of this world, you will very likely be out in touch with God's will. And you don't know what is God's work all about. It's not only in matters of being, being a pastor or missionary. Being a mother is a very tough job. Why do you think most young ladies do not want to have children? Why? Tell me. Why is that they are scared to have another one? Why do they stop at one? They want comfort. No wonder our society is suffering. Not enough people. Comfort first. You look in any area of life, you see this problem. I'm not saying we must purposely beat ourselves. We must... Uh, always say no money, I don't need money, I don't need food, I don't need bed, I will sleep on the floor because Jesus loves me. No, that's not what I'm saying. But if God's will for us is to be a married person, it must be our duty to be a happy wife and happy mother. Don't set your eyes on somebody else's company and run that company for that man. Love your own husbands. Submit to your own husbands. 
Love your husbands and love your children. Keep us at home. There you influence your family. Don't leave it to your maid to run your home. And in the society, there are a lot of people in our neighborhood, the old folks wandering around, even in Singapore. If you are a godly woman, you can reach out to so many of them in your neighborhood, for Christ's sake. You don't have to have an old folks home to help. I can tell you, now all those who are in your 50s, you brought up some of your kids. If you are waiting to die in your own flat, forget about it. Get ready to die in old folks home. Okay? Because we taught our children it's not worth looking after anyone by sacrificing material wealth. When they were young, we put them in child care centers. We give to others to look after. We went to work, make money. And every morning we tell the children, I love you. Uh, see you tonight. And you pick up the child at 8 o'clock or 7.30 in the night, go home, and in the hush and rush of getting ready for the next day, you anyhow study, 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 or turn on the TV, keep quiet, watch that, and you just rush around. The children don't understand what is love, what is motherly instinct. They don't know anything about it. It's all a stressful environment. Next morning, you put the child into your car, buckle up, and go to the child care center, drop, mommy love you, my daddy love you, see you tonight. And when that child starts working and you become old and you become like a child, they will put you in the child, old, old folks' home and say, your son loves you, see you next month, <laughs> if I have time. What you give, you get. Many of you don't remember because time erases our memory. And some of you, in fact, most of you were not there when I first preached a message of this in Shalom BP Church where we were worshiping in the evening. First time I brought up this issue in the church. Mothers, don't abandon your children. If you do, they will abandon you when you're old. At that time, child care center was booming everywhere. It was a big business. Everybody wants to have. Even churches want to run child care center. Pastors were saying, bring your children dumb here. Go and make money. We need more tithes. We will look after. Which pastor is called to babysit? I don't know. What church in the Bible says you must babysit all the kids? It belongs to the parents. Now, at that time I said in the church, and soon we will see old folks home rising. True enough, in 10 years time, old folks home become a necessity in this country. Children got no time. It's not easy to look after kids. It's not easy to take care of old folks. It's very difficult to look after the older ones. Just the other day, when I went to the hospital in Changi, General Hospital, for my own consultations with my doctor. <clears throat> my wife and I met an elderly lady uh, whom we knew for many years at the beginning of our ministry in Gethsemane. They come from Grace BP Church. And this old lady has two daughters, very good Christians. And uh, this lady was uh, at the Hawker Center trying to order a lunch. She came to see the doctor. And so she was sitting on a wheelchair, uh, looking blank. Uh, so I recognized her. I said, oh, this auntie was wow, so old already. I used to see her about 20 years ago. It must be her. And I was carrying my lunch, because I, after seeing the doctor, we wanted to have lunch there. So I put my tray on the table and look at, hello Andy. She gave me a blank look, so I realized something is wrong. Then I turned around, I saw her daughter, she's a Christian. And I greeted her, I said, oh, so you came with your mom? And she said, yes, my mom has terrible dementia. She doesn't talk anymore. And she doesn't recognize people. But I remember 20 years ago, though she doesn't speak English, whenever she saw me in the church, she will smile and sometimes even stand up and shake my hand. 
But now she gives me a blank look. She is a big sized baby. You know, when a baby is this small, easy to look after. When a person is this big, <laughs> become like a baby, it's very hard. And then comes the next daughter, two daughters, side by side. They are not married. And they look after the mom. So I ask them, so who look after your mom when you, when you are working? Oh, thank God. God gave us enough. We are not working. We look after our mother at home. I thought that lady is very blessed. Enough only. Enough. We have a flat. Enough. No need so much money. My mother leaves, needs love. I can tell you. People don't know what love is. This is a dark world. Children grow up without mother's love. But they smell money everywhere. Old folks die without love. I'm talking about Christians, okay? Don't forget about the rest. Forget about the rest for the time being. And we are more and more imbibing welcoming the darkness of the world into our homes and our churches. Somebody go to stop us and say, start thinking please. Is it how God left us in this world? What is this book for? O oh Lord, the statutes of thy word are a guide to me. It's a lamb unto my feet. It's a light to my path. My Christian friends, dear church, instead of becoming like the world, there's a need to live out what the Bible says. The good works, everything it says is absolutely good. Don't you ever think because it doesn't agree with the world and you're thinking this is bad. This alone is good. You turn right or left a bit, you are in the path of terrible sorrow. May God give us grace to understand this. Oh, my dear church. The Lord's church. Let not his word go. Ineffective on us. Let not this word fall on deaf ears. I thank God for 20 over years that God gave to me to preach to all of you. And I have one prayer. Lord, change everyone. Make everyone a light. Yes, some of our men, by God's grace, will become very renowned people. Let them be, we rejoice. But we don't want to grab it. God will give it to us. We work hard, we do God, whatever God uh, wants us to do, in his time he will give promotion. You know, just the other day, our missionary preacher, Donald, sent me an email saying, Pastor, I thank God for his mercies. Many of our brethren here are farmers, and they work hard in the rice field, and in a few weeks' time, they were looking forward for the harvest. But the storm suddenly came. And the rain was so strong. Rivers were about to burst the bank. And we were worried. You know, I could feel his, his concern for the church people. Because this is a livelihood. They work for one whole year. And the earning come only at the end of the season when the harvest is done. If they don't get the harvest, they will be in starvation. This is it. In fact, some of them even take loan to buy the seed to grow them. And he says, though government declared emergency, 
in that area, Dagupan City area. The Lord stopped the rain and the storm in time, so nobody's rice field was destroyed. Thank God. Now that tells me a story. You may work hard, but you may not sit for your exam if God doesn't bless you. You make a million, but you may not even enjoy anything out of it unless God bless you. Why do you want to believe in something that is so transient, something that is never firm and strong? Trust in the eternal word. The word of the Lord endureth forever. The world and its glory will pass away. It's like the grass that grows today and tomorrow withereth away. Only that which is done according to God's will will have all its power and glory just as God designed. How wonderful are these words of Christ. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And I hope to hear testimonies of Christians in our church everywhere I go. And sometimes people stop me and say, you know, oh, you are Pastor Koshi. I... I heard about you. Then I say, how do you know? Oh, you know, I have a good friend who is in your church. Oh, really? Who is that? Oh, her name is this. Oh, his name is this. I say, oh, okay, I know. How do you know? Oh, tell you he's such a good friend of mine. Uh, I'm not a Christian, but he almost made me a Christian. Uh, I want to be like him. Oh, he did so many good things. Oh, such testimonies make me so happy. I will praise God when I hear that. But when somebody says, you're Pastor Koshi from Gethsemane. Oh, you. Say, oh, you know our church, huh? Welcome, welcome. Oh, please. Sir. That's the church I will never come. Why? Because that fellow is in your church, right? That guy? Oh, you. If Christians are like that and your church people are like that, I don't want to come to your church. My goodness. I then cry out, have mercy on us, oh God. Now, if it is true about me, how much more about Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the flock, the head of this church? What is he looking for? That everywhere you go, in your neighborhood, your neighbor know you are a Christian. Your relatives know you are a Christian. Your school know you are a Christian. But mind you, it doesn't mean everybody is going to love you, okay? It means what? Most of the time you get what? Persecution. All right? Now, I don't want you to go home thinking that to be a light in the world is everybody's acceptance. No! People will speak evil of us. But remain committed to the truth you believe. God has his way of breaking down the resistance and cause you to be an influence in this world. So let me end. We need to welcome our Chinese brethren for Holy Communion. Remember this. Verse 16 ends this way. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. God is most glorified when we live out our life as Christ wants it to be. Please don't, <clears throat> please don't draw your own blueprint. God has the best master plan for you just follow that come and listen to God's word daily yield yourself in faith and obedience and you can be nothing but a light in this dark world to give light to many who are lost in their sin may God help you and help us all to be a light in this world